Hello, hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers Sunday Sermon. Uh, this is for us. I'm David Johnson. Uh, let's get started. Going to be a classic solo today. Uh, Mac is uh, doing holiday things that he had uh, told me about before, and I think he's got some uh, things that he's going to have to do next week, too. So that's going to give me a couple of weeks to address a topic that I wanted to address anyway, and hopefully we can finish off that series when Mac gets back. So we're going to talk a bit about the moral defeater, what what I'm calling the moral defeater. Because I don't think the moral argument is anything except trying to be a defeater, and it's and it fails. And I think the way Mac uses it uh, on the board just is is just wrong and bad, and it doesn't defeat anything. But he, he seems to believe that if he can just keep saying, even though it doesn't represent what most people believe, ah, oh, you're just mo- molecules in motion, can't be any right or wrong. Why should anyone uh, listen to your opinion over anyone else's? What makes uh, you know you want to do this thing and not that thing? What makes it right? Why should it matter? Uh, mindless uh, universe, no moral content. That kind of that kind of stuff, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, we're going to address that again. Uh, it's not like I've never addressed this before. I've addressed it many times, and uh, we'll do it again. We'll do it at least once a year, and so maybe it's that time. And so we'll spend uh, a few weeks uh, doing that. I'm uh, going to do it in bits and pieces. So uh, I've got uh, a video uh, that I'm going going to do this week, just kind of introduce the topic. This is a uh, video on the moral argument that I haven't seen, and I don't think there are very many of them that fit that description. Uh, maybe you have, I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a fairly short one, and this is a person, a Christian who is trying to reformulate the moral argument. It's always uh, suspicious when someone needs to reformulate and keep reformulating you know, some classic argument, because it's a problem, you see. <laughs> And so he thinks he's got the uh, fix for the problems. Uh, So, yeah, a a lot of stuff I'm going to save until next week. Um, We'll get into definitions, I think, a little bit more next week. I'll talk about definitions on the board. I think that definitions are important. You should probably always start with definitions. But rather than make this a long monologue, I'm just going to incorporate as much as I can in my comments on this video, and we'll go back and do a little bit of um, a prequel uh, to the subject next week. Here we go. Or that is to say, we just move to the right tab. Here we go. Let's get into the moral argument for God's existence. I think that these arguments can often suffer a lot of problems, so we're going to try and do our best to avoid the most common pitfalls when making such an argument. Now, here's what a good moral argument should do. We directly perceive that there are some moral facts, like that hurting people is wrong and that helping people is good. A moral argument shows that these experiences are somehow invalidated if there is no God, so moral truths are evidence for God's existence. Here's the classic formulation of the moral argument. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values don't exist. Hard disagree. Um, I, I, I'm not going to make this about objective versus subjective morality. But even if you're only dealing with, you know, some formulation of objective morality, premise one is just bad. It's not, it's not true at any, at any level. Two, objective moral values exist. Okay, premise two is just a claim. That's, I don't. It's a, it's kind of a question begging claim. <laughs> so three, therefore God exists. This argument is logically valid. I don't believe it is logically valid. I think it's a very badly formed, uh, argument. I think it's a bad syllogism, but these premises both need a ton of defending. Why is it that specifically a God is needed for morality? And what does it mean for objective morality to exist? Ah. Oh. Great questions. Would you like to hear an atheistic view of objective morality? There's no God required. I'll explain by way of analogy. The rules of chess are arbitrary. However, once we decide what the rules of chess are, there are objectively good moves to beat your opponent. Now, human flourishing is something I care about. You care about it too. 
So if we accept that this is our goal, which we do, there are objectively bad and objectively good ways of reaching said goal. This is morality, which is completely objective. Hmm. Now that may be a useful system to help run a society, but that isn't the same as morality. And Hang on. And I think we're going to need a better definition of morality. I did hint that I would talk about my definitions uh, next week. But if we've already got a good system for running a society, which is, I think, uh, what I would mostly call ethics, I, I use ethics and morality fairly interchangeably. Once again, definitions next week then I'm not entirely sure what else we're looking for. In fact, that couldn't be morality. Well, why do you say that? Well, let me explain by way of analogy. Say there's a blind man who wants to know what the experience of seeing color is like. He understands what it feels like to touch, taste, smell, and hear things. Can you actually explain what seeing color is like in terms of his other senses? Objection, Your Honor. This analogy is irrelevant. No, it's impossible. You see, the experience of seeing color cannot be reduced to the experiences of other senses. Some concepts can be explained in terms of the simpler concepts that they are composed of. But if you get to a concept that isn't made of simpler concepts, you cannot perform the same sort of reduction to explain it. So the natural question for morality is this. Can the concept of morality be reduced to other concepts? Well, no, it can't. Let's say that there's a morally blind man who has no understanding of the concept of morality or of right and wrong or of good and evil, but he understands the way things are in the world. Would you be able to explain morality to him? I'm sorry. What the hell is a morally blind man? I don't even know what you're talking about at this point, and I'm starting to get this sense that you don't know what you're talking about either. No, because morality deals with the way things ought to be, not the way things are. Whoa, hang on. We just added another claim and definition here. So morality is not about the way things are. It's about the way things ought to be. So now we've added ought to this hodgepodge. Therefore, one is not reducible to the other. You could explain to him how to promote human flourishing, and you could even explain to him why he wants humans to flourish. But you cannot explain to him that promoting flourishing is morally good. That's because this last claim contains an irreducible moral component that he simply does not grasp. What is the irreducible moral component? This, this is just a made-up idea at this point. You, you've explained a lot of things that, are, that are, seem to be all that you need to explain. <laughs> Uh, frankly, but you're saying that the conclusion here contains an irreducible moral component. Thus, the atheistic version of morality is not identical to the real moral world that we happen to not be blind to. Gonna have to replay that sentence again. ...version of morality is not identical to that he simply does not grasp. Thus, the atheistic version of morality is not identical to the real moral world that we happen to not be blind to. The real moral world. So, first of all, atheists are morally blind. And the real moral world that we, I assume Christians, are not morally blind to. How is that an explanation of anything? Just by saying, you people over there are blind to this uh, thing that I'm making up, but we're not. How is that an argument? The real morality we experience cannot be reduced. However, the atheistic morality so described is reducible to simpler concepts and is thus not the moral landscape that we're looking for. If it is reducible to simpler concepts, then why do we need more concepts? Wait, are you saying that human flourishing is not morally good? I'm saying that human flourishing indeed has the property of being moral, but the system that you described, where we all accept that flourishing is good and go on from there, is not identical with morality itself. Here, let me... Okay, so the fact that we all agree doesn't make it moral. I would agree with that. It just makes it universal agreement. But we might come back to this. I'm not sure if I will or not. So, um... He's like, that's not what makes it moral. So let's, what does? Let me 
explain this another way. If you want humans to flourish, then certain actions are better than others for achieving that goal. It's better to help the poor and to be nice and so on. If you want humans to die, some other actions would be better than others for achieving your goal. It's better to stockpile nuclear warheads and to punch people and stuff. If you want something arbitrary, like moons to explode, it would still be better to stockpile nuclear warheads, but for a different reason. Okay, is anybody confused by that? Not me. That's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, he's going to have to create some kind of confusion so that he can then provide you with the solution. Let's see how he does. Now, each of these instances of the word better means a different thing. No, it, are no it doesn't. <laughs> No, it doesn't. So this is this is one of the ways he's trying to create confusion. Look at all these betters. They mean different things. No, they don't. No, they don't. We have defined the relationship between the thing that we want and the thing that we have. And if we want the thing that we uh, want, then doing certain actions are better. The, the word better is the same in all of these things. It, so you're you're wrong on the facts. Let's just rewind so you can have a complete sentence. Thing arbitrary, like moons to explode. It would still be better to stockpile nuclear warheads, but for a different reason. Now, each of these instances of the word better means a different thing. These are different standards that you can use to evaluate a given action. There are an infinity of these possible standards. Okay, what does he mean by standard? Because these are not different standards. You can, the, it's, it's right there on the screen if you want to look at it. <laughs> These are not different standards. These are just different scenarios. And if you, if you, this is the scenario that you want to carry out, then some actions are better than others. Those are not different standards. I don't know what he's talking about. Now, here's a question. Is any given standard better than another standard? Well, that depends on the definition of better that you happen to be using. Actually, it depends on the definition of standard that you happen to be using. Because better is very simple here. I don't know what you mean by standard. So it seems like comparing these definitions can't actually be done. Yes, it can. I don't know what you, what are you talking about? I know I keep interrupting here, but this is, this is an artificial tactic to try to create confusion where none exists. This is, this is a common thing with religion. We've got the solution, but our solution doesn't mean anything. We can't, uh, you know, show you the problem. So we have to create the problem <laughs> to make the solution work. He's trying really hard to create a problem, and I just don't see it. When comparing things, you need to hold them to a standard. But the things we are comparing are standards. So choosing a standard is impossible. So when we ask, is it better to jump into a pit of alligators or not to jump? Well, by some standards, it's better, and by other standards, it is worse. No, what do you... Okay. Does he mean desired outcome? Is that what he means by standard? Because I don't know what he's... I don't know... I don't understand what he means by standard. So let's just take this example right here. See if we can work through it. Let's do the calculus. Is it better to jump in a pit of alligators? Why would you jump? Th that's... That's just, that's the only thing you need to know, to know whether it's better or not. Well, there is a, a small child who fell in that pit. And the alligator going to eat the child, and I don't want to see the child get eaten. So if I jump in there, I can distract the alligator long enough for that child to get out. Or maybe I can get to that child and toss him out as the alligator eats me. But either way, saving that child would be a good reason to jump in the pit. Therefore, it would be better to jump in the pit than to just watch the gator eat the child. Right? Is, is, that, com is that complicated to anybody? Because that's not complicated. Wh where's the standard that we're talking about? Okay, there's no child in the pit. The alligator is, uh, alligator is minding his own alligator business. I'm minding my own business. I don't want to get eaten. So would it be better for me to jump in the pit or not? It would not be better. How, that's What are we talking about all these confusing standards? The infinity of standards simply evaluates the actions in a vacuum. Is that the end of the story? Well, no. We all know and experience that there is one standard which has something more to it. We know that there is one standard by which we judge things which is especially correct. This kind of specialness is really hard to describe if you don't already know it. Okay. Is this where we enter the whole special pleading section? You see, there's there's this standard that we know is correct. We know it. You know. 
You know what I'm talking about, right? You know this standard is correct. Um, really? Really? Uh, and, and it's, and it's special, right? And, and the people who know it, know it, right? <laughs> this is, this is his argument. This is a big innovation. So let's play that again. I'll let you hear him say it. Is that the end of the story? Well, no. We all know and experience that there is one standard which has something more to it. We know that there is one standard by which we judge things which is especially correct. This kind of specialness is really hard to describe if you don't already know it, but we all understand what the special property is, and we've named it morality or goodness, if you will. Okay, but we already had things named morality and goodness. So you're just, you're creating this new thing that you know it if you know it, and you're giving it, uh, you're repurposing a name that we already have for the things that we can describe and use common language for. But now you've, you've, you've just created this special thing and repurposed a common word to now mean something mystical. But what gives this one standard specialness? That we all agree on it or that we all like it? No. If we all agreed on a standard that involved decreasing human flourishing, we would all be wrong because the uniquely correct standard would still be correct. Its specialness extends beyond that. And it seems that if such a standard has this irreducible property of being the standard of morality, there must be a metaphysically special thing giving that standard that... Wait a minute. If the standard has the special property of being the irreducible... So if this thing is magical like I say it is, then it's magical. I d Let's try it again. Specialness extends beyond that. And it seems that if such a standard has this irreducible property of being the standard of morality, there must be a metaphysically special thing giving that standard that property. And if Christmas magic is real, then Santa Claus exists. You have not made an argument here. You're just making up uh, supernatural things now and saying that, therefore, there must be a, a metaphysical thing to explain this metaphysical thing that I just made up. But more on that later. Now, if a standard has this metaphysically special property, I can make moral claims about the way things ought to be because my claims reference this standard, this special property. If there is no such reality of the property, then I cannot make claims about the way things ought to be, just the way things are. It just happens to be the case that I prefer human flourishing, but there's nothing intrinsically moral about it. To sum up, we can make all the statements in the world about the way things are, or what it is that we prefer, or the best way to reach a given goal. But there are also moral claims that we can make. The thing called morality, which these claims reference, is very interesting. It's a special standard that we use to judge things, but its specialness is not reducible to other concepts if you analyze it. Now, the skeptic can agree at this point. Our moral experience would be invalidated if there were no claims about the way the world ought to be, and all that existed were counterfactual claims and claims about the way the world was. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that statement at all. But how do you go from this property mysteriously existing to there being a god? Well, if there is this irreducible concept of morality, that immediately raises the question of why it exists at all. Okay. Notice what he says here. If there is this thing that I made up, this is the second time he's done this now. If there is this thing that I made up, then this other thing that I'm making up has to exist. This is, this is kind of the nature of his argument and the form it's taking all the way through. I just wanted you to, to notice the maneuver that he's doing. This irreducible concept of morality that immediately raises the question of why it exists at all. Morality is a very specific standard that deals with the interactions of persons and very specific mental states of those persons. And since it isn't reducible to logic or counterfactuals or preferences, it cries out for some deeper explanation. No, actually, what you've just described is society. You know, the social interaction between human beings with complex uh, brains and nervous systems uh, that have to be interdependent in order to survive and flourish. That, that's all you've described. And the social systems that we construct to make a better society is morality. We don't need some supernatural substrate to explain that. 
We'll call whatever it is that makes some things have the property of being moral and other things not have the property of being moral the grounding of morality. Now, what could possibly be this morality grounding thing? Well, God would fit the bill. He's okay, so would Santa Claus, uh, universe creating pixies, uh, the flying spaghetti monster? Seems to be a prime candidate, as this property of morality can exist as an outflowing of his essence. Voldemort. Or something. But this doesn't mean that something else couldn't act as the thing which grounds morality. This grounding relation is very mysterious. Maybe humans have souls or natures or something. This grounding relation is very mysterious. Well, you know why it's very mysterious? Because you've made it up to describe a thing that you've made up that you described, uh, that you're using to describe a thing that you made up. <laughs> this, this is why it's so mysterious. If you just go back to the part where you're not making up things, this is all pretty simple. This grounding relation is very mysterious. Maybe humans have souls or natures or something, and this immaterial soul does the job of grounding moral facts about individuals with those souls. Fine. Because the relation between morality and whatever grounds it is so mysterious, I don't see why a soul couldn't ground moral facts. But if humans did have souls, that seems to be pretty good evidence that God exists. No, it isn't. I'm not a substance dualist, everybody knows that. But if human beings did have souls, that, that's not evidence that God would exist. That's just evidence that uh, that's a part of what makes up humans, that we have souls. It's a part of the natural, that's a part of nature. Uh, we haven't discovered the unifying theory of everything. The theory, theory of gravity is, <laughs> is still kind of out there. <laughs> uh, so maybe we haven't uh, discovered uh, souls either. But maybe that's a part of nature as well, that, that we're still looking for answers to. There's nothing that says that a soul can't be a natural thing, that it requires a god. A again, more, more question begging here. Theism makes perfect sense of why humans are endowed with these immaterial essences. No, it, <laughs> it doesn't, actually. But it, let's just say it does. It, it also doesn't make a better case for why we would have souls than naturalism. Extending this, any plausible account of there being a thing which grounds morality makes way more sense given God's existence. No matter how you do it, divine command theory or even moral Platonism, there being something that grounds morality will need God at some point or another. No, it does not. We can use this to reformulate the moral argument. One, if morality has no metaphysically special grounding, then morality is nothing more than facts about preferences. Great. So, do we need to go past one? I don't think so. Two, morality is more than facts about preferences. Says who? Where was your... Was there anything in this video besides a claim of that? <laughs> Did I miss it? Somebody please give me the timestamp. Three, therefore, morality has a metaphysically special grounding. Now, you could replace facts about preferences to whatever it is that the skeptic tries to reduce morality to. This argument will be sound no matter what someone reduces morality to, because we have direct knowledge that morality is not, in fact, reducible. Four. Wait, wait. We have direct knowledge that morality is not reducible. Where does that direct knowledge come from again? What was that direct knowledge, or is this just another one of those things you, that you made up earlier? Probably, if morality has a metaphysically special grounding, then God exists. Well, if it probably is the case that God exists, it's also probably the case that he doesn't. Five. Therefore, probably God exists. And therefore, probably God doesn't. What, how do, <laughs> what did we accomplish here? <laughs> I think that this argument is pretty clear, and I'm currently quite confident in its soundness. If anyone has any thoughts about this variation, please let me know. That's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Please. I, I have some thoughts about this variation. It sucks. <laughs> so, look, you know what I think? What do you think? Oh, we're, we've got more to do. We've got more work to do on this. So we're going to talk uh, very specifically about some of the conversations that have been had on the board. We're going to uh, deal very specifically with some arguments that I think that Mac is making and some of the problems uh, with that. We're going to deal uh, with definitions, and we might even throw in another video next week. And we'll get to Mac uh, the week after that, and we'll see if this dialogue 
can put this particular non-defeater defeater to bed. You know what to do. Skepticsandseekers.squarespace.com. Log in your Discuss account and discuss away. Send me an email at skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. Until the next time, I will see you in the comments. And in the meantime, I'm out.